I'm Father Frank McFarland from the Boston Catholic Television Center, and I thank you for joining us today. I'm standing in East Boston on the top of Orient Heights. It's a huge hill that overlooks Boston Harbor. Varied events in the American Revolution took place here. It is on this hill that one gets a magnificent view of Logan Airport. Logan Airport, the seventh largest airport in the world, where literally millions of people fly to Europe, Asia, and all parts of the United States, say nothing of the most traveled air route in the world, Boston to New York. You probably even now can hear the jets in the background. But on the top of this hill, there is something that is very special to all of us. It is the Don Orione Shrine. There is a huge statue here, a statue that is known as Our Lady Queen of the Universe. The statue was brought here in 1954, and it has a delightful and beautiful history. The Don Orione Fathers have their headquarters in Rome. And during the time of the Nazi occupation, in Rome during World War II, the Don Orione Fathers saved many Jewish people, and they did it in a delightful and clever way. As they hid Jewish people in their monastery, they dressed them as priests. And there was one man, and I have to write down his name or I forget it, there was one man by the name of Arrigo Minervi. And Arrigo was a Jewish sculptor, and he was in hiding with the Don Orione Fathers. He was dressed as a priest traveling around Rome, and he was taking a bus. And the Nazi soldiers stopped the bus and went to every passenger on the bus and asked for a passport. Arrigo Minervi, a Jew in hiding, had no passport. And for some strange reason, when the Nazi soldiers got to Arrigo, sitting in the back of the bus, they didn't bother to ask for his passport. Maybe they were bored. They just turned and got off the bus. He was quivering with fright. And he attributes his safety and his salvation and his life to the prayers of the Don Orione Fathers. And so in thanksgiving to the Don Orione community and in thanksgiving to Our Lady, he sculpted this magnificent 35-foot statue. And the Don Orione Fathers brought it to East Boston to put on the highest spot where Our Lady could watch over the Archdiocese of Boston. Don Orione himself was quite a man. Uh, he lived in the time of our gay 90s. He wanted to be a priest, but his health wasn't good enough. And so he prayed to Our Lady, and finally another seminary took him. And at that particular time, while he was a seminarian, there was an earthquake in Messina. And he worked with the people who suffered in the earthquake. And he saw elderly and sick who lost everything and were beggars on the street. And so Don Orione founded a religious order that is dedicated to serving the poorest of the poor. The Don Orione fathers and sisters are now all over the world, in Europe, Latin America, in New York City other parts of the United States, and they came here to Boston after World War II. Four of them came, and all they had was a house on this hill. And that hill at that time was a cow pasture. And now they have a magnificent institution where they service the poor, the needy, the elderly. There are varied sections. There are people who live here. And then there is a huge daycare center 
where the elderly may come for the day, have companions, religious services, good food, proper medication, and then go back to their homes at night. The Don, Ori Don Orione fathers are very proud of the fact that 93% of the residents and the people who come here are on some kind of assistance. This shrine is very popular. Neighbors, benefactors, buried friends come here and walk around this plaza and they say the rosary, they make the stations of the cross. Groups come from parishes, ladies' sodalities, and they have mass here and they pray. Our Lady, Queen of the Universe. You know, Mary is awfully important to us as Catholics. Mary is awfully important to our theology. For us to have resurrection, we have to tie in somehow with the suffering of Jesus. But the suffering of Jesus would not have done you or me any good unless he shared our humanity. He had to be one of us. Otherwise, his death and resurrection would have been just another marvel of his work, but wouldn't have saved us any more than a sunset saves us or the beauty of the Grand Canyon. So Jesus became a man like us in all things save sin. And that means he had to have our humanity. But the humanity had to come from someone human and someone who could make up for the arrogance of Adam and Eve who had said no. And so Mary, in her beauty and in her generosity, when confronted by the angel Gabriel, said, yes, be it done unto me according to thy word. And at that moment, the eternal Christ, the model after which all humanity is formed, the eternal Christ, the blueprint of all creation, enfleshed and incarnated himself and Mary. And she wove around his divinity the humanity he needed to save us. Mary, of course, is important for another reason. St. Paul says that if you and I are to share in the resurrection of Jesus, then we must enter into his passion. In some way, we have to identify with Good Friday so that we can share the glory of Easter. And we need a model for that. And Mary gives us that. Mary, a hard life, lived in poverty, saw her own son go off to, quote, do his own thing, entered into the passion more than anyone else as she watched her son tried, found guilty, murdered, and then she buried him. Then Mary no sooner had the joy of the resurrection when she saw her son ascend into heaven, leaving her with church work and the fight of the early church to survive. Mary entered into the passion of Christ by sharing his suffering working for his church, and when Mary died, we believe her body was assumed into heaven and she was made queen. And isn't that kind of what happens to you and to me? We too have to say yes to the Lord when there's inconvenience, when it perhaps interferes with our lives, but out of love we say yes. And then we have our moments of crucifixion, be it discouragement, the loneliness, uh, the sadness of Gethsemane, or the day-to-day -day carrying of a cross, or sometimes we feel we too hang with the Lord on his cross as we're suspended between heaven and earth and we feel we don't belong in either place. And while we too have the uplift of, of Easter and some resurrection bounce, we also have the loneliness of living within the church as today it struggles to survive. And this is how we enter into the passion so that we might have hope of resurrection. And just as Mary,
who in the words of St. Paul entered into the passion of Christ so that she might rise with him, Mary was assumed body and soul into heaven. And this is why Vatican Council says Mary is a type. She is typical of us. I don't like the phrase, but what it means is this, that Mary is the model. What happens to Mary happens to you and to me. Just as we follow Christ and say yes to him, just as we let the Spirit come in and we try to give flesh to Christ as he lives in us, just as we carry our cross as we struggle in the church and hope for resurrection and union with him, so too did Mary. And what happened to her is going to happen to us. And therefore, Mary followed Jesus and had her own Easter. And again, it was St. Paul who said Christ was the first of many to rise from the dead. Well, Mary was one of the many that came along, rose from the dead, and is assumed into heaven. And she's our model. She's one who has gone before us to show, yes, the effects of Jesus fall to others. And therefore, she is our hope. She is typical of us. She is what happens to us, and she is our mother and our help. And I just think it is magnificent that here in the city of Boston, when visitors fly in, one of the first things they see is a statue of Mary, your mother and mine, and the mother of Jesus, standing there proudly saying, remember who you are and what you are. And no matter how heavy the cross, no matter how hard to say yes, no matter how impatient you might be in waiting and living in the church community and struggling, your Easter is coming. I had mine, and you'll have yours. And my son will see to it, and so will I. At the base of this gigantic and beautiful statue is a huge plaza. And around the plaza are mosaics of the mysteries of the rosary, outdoor stations of the cross, and people come from all over New England to pray to Our Lady, Queen of the Universe. Every evening, neighbors, residents of the Don Orione home, and pilgrims come and have outdoor devotions. If the weather's bad, there is a huge church under this plaza. And they pray the rosary, and they recite the old litany that you and I knew, calling Our Lady all kinds of titles. And as I went through that litany, it dawned on me how many churches in the archdiocese there are whose name is one of the titles of the litany. And I'm standing here on a very windy hill with the airport behind me, the city of Boston in the background, and the Boston Harbor right here. It's a windy hill, but it overlooks the archdiocese where there are so many churches named after Our Lady with titles from the litany. So I wrote down on a piece of paper uh, some of the titles uh, that we invoke Our Lady under. For instance, in Quincy, we have a church by the name of Our Lady of Good Counsel. What does that mean? Mary, who lived the life of the gospel, who entered into the passion of Christ, who said yes to the Holy Spirit, Mary, who always was with the Lord and let him act in her life, was open to the Spirit, loved the Father, Mary, who is our mother, gives us good advice. After all, at the marriage feast of Cana, she said to the young couple about her son, do whatever he tells you. And that, Mary, that maybe is Mary's advice to us now, do whatever Jesus says. And so she's so filled with the Spirit, we say she's filled with wisdom. She's our mother, and therefore by her prayers, she gives us good advice. 
And so we call her Our Lady of Good Counsel, and there's a church in Quincy. In Chelsea, there's a, uh, a church by the name of Our Lady of Grace. And so much grace and spirit come to us through Mary. After all, Mary is part of the body of Christ. She's part of the church. Mary is our mother. And hence, when we pray to her, she comes rushing to our aid as any mother would. If it were not for Mary having said yes, if it were not for Mary having given human nature to Jesus, we wouldn't have grace or spirit anyway. So it is through her that we have Jesus, we have salvation, we have spirit, we have grace. So on another hill in Chelsea, there's a church, Our Lady of Grace. And then, of course, out in Waltham, there is a church called Our Lady Comforter of the Afflicted. Well, did you ever know a mother that didn't come running to the aid of a sick child? Let one of us be in trouble. Let one of us be sick. And boy, does mother come running. And down through the years, so many people who have been hurting, who have perhaps been burdened by a cross, who perhaps have been sick with sin, children, parts of the body of Christ, Mary, our mother, has come running. And so someone decided that in Waltham, they'd put up a church and call it Mary Comfort of the Afflicted. And then, of course, in Dedham, there is a seminary for the African missionaries called Mary Queen of Apostles Seminary. Now, why is Mary Queen of the Apostles? Well, first of all, she was with the apostles when the Holy Spirit came down upon them. And you remember how frightened and confused they were and how they were bickering with one another and how they had to organize themselves to start the infant church. And Mary was with them when the apostles came, uh, when the Holy Spirit came, and Mary was with them for a good number of years before she was assumed into heaven. We are told that Mary probably gave much information to St. Luke so that he could write his gospel. Mary, therefore, was a strong, dominant figure in the early church. She was the mother of Jesus. She was the mother of their Lord. She was their queen. Hence, we call her Queen of the Apostles. And then, of course, in South Boston, there's a church called Gate of Heaven. And Mary really is the Gate of Heaven. And it comes down to the fact that Mary said yes and thus began our redemption. It is because she said yes, gave Christ the humanity he needed, that he could hang upon the cross and we could benefit from it. We can benefit from the resurrection because he's one of us. You've heard the old story that Bishop Sheen used to tell on television in the early days. He told the story of St. Peter and our Lord walking around heaven. And Jesus said to Peter, you see that one over there? How did he get into heaven? And Peter said, don't blame me, Lord. I go around, I lock all the doors, and your mother lets everyone in the window and the back door. Remember the words of the Memorari written by St. Bernard, that never was it known that anyone who fled to her protection asked her help or sought her intercession was left unaided. So very often, if Jesus isn't enough to win us over, a mother's love does. There's many a soul in heaven because Mary was the gate, the back door, or the window that let them in. Uh, Star of the Sea, right here in East Boston. Mary, Star of the Sea. In the old days, before there were good computer ways of navigating ships, they found their way across the vast ocean by following certain stars, which gave them direction. Mary, our model, Mary, our mother, as we cross the sea of life amid confusion, darkness, fear, and insecurity, She's there as our 
nature's solitary boast, with the grace of God and the Spirit of God, you can become queen of heaven and be assumed and share Easter. She is there with a mother's love and light guiding us. There are many, many titles in the litany of Our Lady. I just chose some of those because you perhaps know some of the churches that are named after titles in that litany. There is a new title that we frequently use to invoke Our Lady's aid, and it is Mary, Mother of the Church. Now remember what the Church is. The Church is the body of the risen Jesus Christ. All those who are baptized are the members of his new body. We are the selves. We are the members, and he is our head. We are connected to him. We are welded to him. We are wedded to him. We are in such an intimate and close relationship with Jesus Christ that we are like the members of his body. And grace and spirit flow from him to us, uniting us to himself and with each other. And therefore, the risen Christ, no longer limited to time, space, or dimension, the risen Christ who can permeate all creation, the risen Christ in whom we live and move and have our existence, to live in Christ is like living in the air, like being in the breeze and the wind of this hill here at Orient Heights in East Boston. Christ is explosive, and we live in him and we are one with him. But Mary is still his mother, and you can't separate the head from the body. And since she is the mother of Jesus the Christ, she is mother of Jesus as he is now, the whole body, and that body is the church. Hence, Mary is the mother of the church. Jesus loves us so much. If a crucifix and his bleeding love is not enough to win our hearts, he even goes one more step. And his final gift to us on Good Friday was the last step. If the crucifix didn't win us over, then maybe all of us who have had a mother that we love, all of us who have a mother with whom we have a bond, be she living or dead, all of us have something within us. There's something special about mother. Jesus, a man like us in all things save sin, knew that. And so if the cross couldn't win us over, he thought maybe a mother's love could. And so he gave us his mother to be our mother. I've told some of you before the wild story of an eccentric priest back in the 40s in the Archdiocese of New York. During his heyday, he was one of their finest priests. In his old age, he became uh, kind of an eccentric. And they used to say that on Good Friday, he would stand up and he would have, in the middle of the service, the drum and bugle corps play taps for the dead Christ at 3 o'clock. And then he would have the congregation say an Our Father and a Hail Mary for the repose of the soul of Christ. And I don't know if the story is true or not, but it's a delightful story about an eccentric old man in the Archdiocese of New York and how silly it is to pray for Christ. Of course, father was, his father was going to raise him from the dead, and Christ wasn't going to spend time in purgatory. But Christ now is attached to a body that is human, that is struggling, that is hurting. 
his church. And I'm going to beg you today, the church right now has some bad publicity here and there. There's turmoil and division within. There are onslaughts from without because our message is not always the way of the world. The body just now is a little weak because nationally, some estimates as high as 80% of our people have abandoned the practice of the faith. I'm going to ask you, as wild as it sounds, to pray for the body of the Son of Mary. I'm going to ask you to pray for the church, the body of Christ. Christ is raised. Christ is glorified, and he's trying to pull the rest of his body along. But we still have the weakness of Adam. We're still struggling. We're hurting, and we're not perfected, and he's weighted down by us. Pray to Mary, the mother of that body, the mother of the church, that the body will totally share in the resurrection of Jesus the head. I like this statue. If you'll notice the hand, it very gently has a finger raised. And it's as if Mary, like any good mother, with pride and love is saying, look at my son, isn't he wonderful? You see, Mary leads us to Jesus. And sometimes, if he, his grace, his spirit, his scripture doesn't do it, maybe what's right in a gut reaction in our heart, a love of a mother will do it. Look to the statue of Mary. She's pointing to Jesus. And he and she can make a difference in your life.